Good morning. You know, that is just that saying. We talked about it last week. But what a beautiful thing, especially when we remember our baptisms, that we were buried with Christ in our baptism, that we might die to sin, and we've been raised with him, that we might live new lives now and count ourselves as dead to sin and offer our bodies as, as instruments of righteousness, all because Christ has been raised from the dead. What a joy. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Just uh, two brief announcements. Uh, first, you should have received uh, on Saturday an invitation to the Sunday morning Bible study. It's, it's planned for 10 o'clock. Uh, there's the codes to get into Zoom. If you've never been on Zoom, it's relatively easy to get in. Uh, you just have to search it, click it. Uh, I had very few problems with it. I'm forever having problems with stuff like this. So please, take a look in your email. Uh, it's at 10 o'clock. It's live, uh, so we're not recording it or anything. You can join late, um, but we're not going to be able to go back and look at it, so please. The second thing is, I owe an apology. I was asked to have a prayer last week that I left out. Uh, Vera Walk celebrated her 90th birthday, and uh, that was last Sunday, that day, and I simply left her out of the prayers. And Vera, I'm, I'm sincerely sorry. We wish you happy birthday, and we'll pray for you today because we never run out the need for prayers. Those are our announcements for this morning, so please uh, now get ready as we meditate through the, the ringing of the bells and the prelude.
The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. My shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever.
A reading from Ezekiel chapter 34. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his sheep that have been scattered, so I will seek out my sheep, and I will rescue them from all places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. And I'll bring them out of the peoples and gather them from the countries, and will bring them into their own land. And I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, by the ravines, and in all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them with good pasture, and on the mountain heights of Israel shall be their grazing land. I myself will be the shepherd of the sheep. I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak and the fat, and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them in justice. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from 1 Peter, chapter 2. And Peter writes, For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
A reading from St. John, chapter 10. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, he does not own the sheep. He sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. Sing to the Lord and bless his name. Proclaim his salvation from day to day. Give to the Lord all glory and strength. Give him the honor due his name. Alleluia, alleluia. Now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that sleep. Give to the Lord all glory and strength. Give him the honor to his name. Alleluia, alleluia. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, amen. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. On our best days, we all confess that boldly. Jesus is my shepherd, I lack nothing. If Jesus is my shepherd, what else could I possibly need? But then days go by and we start needing things. We may lack groceries or toiletries. We may need an income or an unemployment check. We may want more human interaction. Or if we've been with the kids all day, maybe less. And frankly, things just aren't going as planned. The spring did not go as planned. Summer may be the same. Life seems to be passing us by. The Lord is my shepherd? Well, where is he? I shall not want? I have all sorts of needs. The words don't seem to be true. But consider the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Do you remember that one? It's found in Luke chapter 16. It's a story about a rich unbeliever who had everything in this life, but then he died and went to hell. And it's a story about a poor Christian named Lazarus who had nothing, but then he died and he found peace in heaven. During his time on earth, people would have said that Lazarus lacked everything. He lacked health. He lacked friends. He lacked food. He lacked an income. He lacked a home. He lacked clothes. He lacked comfort. He lacked happiness. I shall not want. This poor man was in want of everything. But that's from an earthly perspective. For he had one thing, and that was Jesus. So now in heaven, 
Lazarus can boldly say, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. You see, these words are true from the vantage point of believers, from the vantage point of eternity. Surely, Christians on earth will have many needs. Jesus says, in this world, you will have many troubles. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Psalm 23 continues. He makes me lie down in the green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Now that's a flowery picture. We imagine happy little sheep enjoying a pristine valley. But in real life terms, what is this about? Well, it's describing how Christians feed on God's word. Arguably, the whole psalm is a meditation on the blessings of God's Word. For the blades of grass that the sheep eat, those are the promises of Jesus. And that cool water, that is His soothing and comforting and refreshing gospel. For whenever you hear the Word preached, or attend a Bible study, or have home devotions, or receive absolution, or partake of the supper, there is Jesus feeding you, sustaining you, and as the psalm says, restoring your soul. Now that word restore, that's conversion language, or at very least, it's the language of repentance. Surely, we, like sheep, have all gone astray. We turn each one to our own way. But this shepherd seeks out the lost so that he might restore us. And when he finds a stray, he binds up the wounds, and he puts the sheep on his shoulders to carry it home. What a beautiful picture of repentance. This picture is not one of sheep that have to seek out the shepherd. This is not a picture of sheep that have to prove themselves worthy by hanging their heads with great displays of sorrow. No, this picture of repentance is one of a shepherd who seeks out foolish sheep because they're in peril and only he can save them. With his law, the shepherd puts his shepherd's crook around their necks and yanks them away from sin, which can sting a bit. But then with his gospel, he gently heals us and he carries us back to the good grazing land. And having been restored by the gospel promises, he now leads us in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. How kind is it that this Jesus continually sets us back on the right path? He is so very patient, for we so often go astray. Perhaps you've been tempted by the path of anger. Perhaps lately it's been easy for you to lose your temper. Perhaps you've wandered down the path of lust, and right now you feel lost. Perhaps you've gone down the road of pride, and you don't feel lost, <laughs> but you are. Perhaps you've wandered down greed, or gossiping, or laziness, or whatever. There are so many false paths, too many to list. But today I have good news. For in the Word, indeed in this sermon, the Good Shepherd is seeking you, and he is restoring you, 
and he is leading you back onto the path of righteousness. And he does so for his name's sake. That phrase, for his name's sake, is not a throwaway phrase. It is of the utmost importance. Because it tells us why he does it. He's not doing this because you deserve it. Rather, he acts on your behalf because he's acting according to his name. He's acting according to his character. He does it simply because that's who he is. God first revealed his name in the Exodus. He says, the Lord, the Lord, I am a God gracious and merciful. I am slow to anger. I abound in steadfast love and faithfulness, and I forgive sins. That is his name. And so why does he feed you? Why does he restore your soul? Why does he lead you on the righteous path? Only for his name's sake. Because that's simply who he is. He is good. And he desperately desires your salvation. Therefore, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. In this section about the shadow of death, we recognize that the dangers are real. Truly, Christians have many problems. Death casts a shadow over all of us. The world we live in is a world full of evil, a world full of death and decay. In fact, our very bodies are wasting away. From the time we're conceived, we're already dying. And it's not just us, it's the whole world. The more we think about our existence, the more we realize that it's both fragile and fleeting. Everything in this fallen world is temporary. Death defines it all. Nothing lasts. That is, except for Jesus. For although men are like grass, the word of the Lord endures forever. He's the one thing we can never lose. Therefore, if he is our shepherd, we shall not want. Therefore, I will fear no evil, for the one who endures is with me. Remember, Jesus already went through the valley of death, and he came out on the other side immortal. He died, but behold, he is now alive forevermore. And he has the keys to death and Hades. So then, death's dominion has been turned completely upside down. This dying world has been flipped on its head. Everything is now different. Christ has shown that life isn't temporary. No, it's death that's temporary. And life is not fragile. No, it's death that's become fragile. And life is not fleeting. No, death is fleeting. And life is not short. No, it's death that is short. Indeed, because of Easter, death is now running out of time. His time is short, for he's been given the death sentence by Jesus. It was a strange and dreadful strife when life and death contended. The victory remained with life. The reign of death was ended. This all reminds me of something suggested by a seminary professor. He suggested that we all put on our tombstones, this is only a temporary setback. Friends, isn't that incredible to say in the midst of a dying world that death, eh, it's just a temporary setback. 
death is temporary. Because of Christ, death has found its limit. Death bit off more than it could chew. And now, like Jonah's fish, it must spew us out. Because Christ is risen, even now, death has begun to decay. Death is already losing its grip. And soon and very soon, death will die. This is why I now fear no evil, for he who is risen is with me. And then comes the line that always makes me chuckle. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The word rod describes something like a club. And the word staff is a more slender piece of wood that can be used for jabbing, even stabbing. So this could be translated, your club and your spear, they comfort me. In modern language of ranchers, we might say, your rifle and your shotgun, they comfort me. Now, why would that be comforting to a sheep? Because they show that our shepherd is a warrior and he is willing and ready to fight. Remember, David, who wrote this, was a shepherd in his youth, and he often had to fight off wild beasts. If David was willing to do this for just some lousy sheep, how much more will Jesus do this for his bride, for those redeemed by his precious blood? You know, Christians are often comforted by the gentleness of this image of the Good Shepherd. Our Good Shepherd gently holds the sheep in his arms. But this image is also comforting because of the fierceness of the shepherd, because of his wrath towards the enemy. That comforts me, knowing that he is relentless in his efforts to defend me. For this one was willing even to lay down his life if it meant that I would live. His weapons are not those of modern day. They are just simple wood. And yet, with his weapon of wood, the cross, he has crushed the foe. The psalmist then says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Seeing that our shepherd is attending to those wolves, we have nothing to worry about. We can have peace. Knowing that Jesus is focused on the enemy, we are now able to find rest and focus on the green grass, even though the enemy is near. Just imagine sheep in a valley, but all around on the hills, there are these hungry wolves. These wolves prowl along the perimeter, bearing their fangs. It's scary, but these wolves dare not get any closer because they have felt the sting of the shepherd's rod and his staff. So then within the perimeter, there is peace in the presence of my enemies. There is even joy for the sheep have food and rest under the shadow of their shepherd. This really is a picture of attending church. In the midst of this crazy world filled with danger and problems, here in this room, he prepares a table for you in the presence of the enemies. Here he anoints your head with oil, baptizing you and absolving you and washing away your stains. And it is here that the cup runneth over. For his blessings are super abundant and they never run out. So then, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, 
and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's interesting language. Goodness and mercy shall follow me. That word follow could actually be tra translated pursue. It would then read, goodness and mercy are pursuing me. Why does the psalm come to this conclusion? Because the one who is good and the one who is merciful will always pursue you. What a wonderful conclusion. Isn't it wonderful to know that he always pursues us? I love that hymn verse from the King of Love, My Shepherd is. It says, Perverse and foolish oft I've strayed, and yet in love he sought me, and on his shoulder gently laid, and home rejoicing brought me. The one who is good and merciful is always in pursuit, seeking you in love, and rejoicing in this work. Indeed, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. And can you see Jesus' face in that moment that he finds you? There you are, lost in the filth of your sin. You've done it again. There you are, disgusting, with your wool all matted down, sickly thin from hunger, dirty and scared. But he scoops you up, and he places you on his shoulders to carry you home. Can you see his face in that moment? Surprisingly, he doesn't look angry. He doesn't look frustrated or annoyed. Actually, he's smiling. His face is beaming. He's bursting with joy. For he's just glad that you're coming home. For if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I tell you the truth, there is joy in heaven when even one sinner repents. And having received forgiveness, I am confident that I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Often people hear that expression as saying, we will live in heaven forever which is perfectly fine and true. But the house of the Lord is a reference to the temple. And Jesus says of his body, destroy this temple and I'll rebuild it on the third day. The true house of the Lord is the flesh of Jesus. The same flesh that died for you. The same flesh that rose for you. The same flesh you receive at this table. The same flesh of which you are now part. For you are members of his body through faith. This flesh is where we will dwell forever. Like finding a home in a cave. We find our home in his scars. For we know that if he lives, we also shall live. And neither life, nor death, nor angels, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God found in Christ Jesus our Lord, our shepherd. Amen.
Normally at this point in time, we would take our offering. We thank those who have been so supportive of the ministries of this church and have continued to give their offerings by dropping them off or by mailing them in or by using electronic giving. You indeed are a blessing and a witness to the goodness of our Lord Jesus. And for that, we thank you. We continue with prayer. Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, hear my prayer, and let my cry come to you. O God, through the humiliation of your Son, you raised up the fallen world. Grant to your faithful people, rescued from the peril of everlasting death, perpetual gladness and eternal joys. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. We give you thanks, Heavenly Father, that you have provided the true Good Shepherd for us, one who loved us enough to lay down his life for us that we might live and was raised again to life that we might live eternally. Grant to us faithful years that we might ever hear the call of our shepherd and so follow him. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our fellow Christians, both here at St. John and throughout the world, that they might receive your good word with ears of faith in difficult times, and that by your grace those who are persecuted may stand steadfast in the face of all threats, even death itself, knowing that no evil may be feared for those who are in Christ, for we belong to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the sick and the ill, that you might grant healing as you see fit, especially for those with COVID-19, that they might, in the midst of their suffering, remember your goodness. For those who mourn at the time of death, that they might receive comfort and peace that comes in the resurrection of your Son, and that those who die in the faith might receive the joy of everlasting life in the new heavens and the new earth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give you thanks, Heavenly Father, for Vera Walk and the blessing she is to her family and to so many. We thank you for the example of faith and steadfastness she has been to all. Grant that we might learn from her to trust as she has trust and that by your goodness we might together inherit the gift of eternal life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the workers that are provided for us, especially those in the medical field, the nurses, the doctors, the aides, the, the, those who work in respiratory therapy, and all others, that by your goodness they might find protection from the illnesses that surround them and that by your goodness they might be agents of your healing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all the first responders, the police, police officers, the EMTs, all those who are firefighters, that they might be kept safe in this time of danger and they may not have fear that overcomes their willingness to do their jobs. For those who are in the military, that you may keep them safe from all enemies, those who carry guns and this virus as well. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Be with the leaders of our nation, that they might have wisdom and understanding. Be with the leaders of our church body, that they might guide us in this difficult and unforeseen time with wisdom and understanding. Grant to them all 
the presence of your spirit that they might serve as you intend. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have safely brought us to the beginning of this day. Defend us in the same with your mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings being ordered by your governance may be righteous in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.